Hi friends, uh, I want to make a disclaimer before I start this talk. Uh, I think there are a lot of really important talks that are happening at JSConf this year, including the one that's happening over the next frame right now. And those talks are on important topics that can help us as technologists make the world a more accessible, equitable, and honestly affirming place for everybody. And then there's this talk. Uh, my name is Kyle Hill, and I live in Washington, D.C., and these days I'm a code school teacher that works with new developers. Uh, this is a story about terrible ideas, uh, specifically uh, through the lens of a terrible idea that I had and executed this summer. Uh, in 2010, the D.C. government introduced a dot bike share system called Capital Bike Share. For a while, it was the largest such system in the entire world, at least until New York City installed theirs many years later. Uh, at this point, there are something like 570 stations across the D.C. metropolitan area, with more still being added every week. Seriously, they installed this station while I was writing this talk in a bar about two weeks ago, right in front of me. So, at any of the solar-powered stations, you can use your credit card or RFID key, which looks like this, to rent a bike, take it anywhere for a half hour with a library book, and wait for the green, white, and happy acknowledgement sound to go off and walk away. The bikes themselves are, you know what, we're, we're going to be positive and uplifting here today. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're heavy. Each one weighs about 40 pounds, which means that they're durable. Uh, the handlebars have a very, very sticky piece of grip. Um, sometimes the front brakes don't work. Sometimes the back brakes don't work. These are not usually exclusive conditions. Um, and uh, the turning radius is approximately the size of the stage that I'm standing on for safety. Uh, so they're not actually fixies, though. Uh, they have three gears each, which have their uses. Uh, for the first gear, there's and for the second gear, you're actually climbing the Tournelay and Tour de France. And the third gear is literally everything else except you're riding through a waving pool of jello. But it's public infrastructure. And nine years on from when the stations were first installed, a lot of the original bikes are still in use with just like a modicum of upkeep. And I really do mean it when I call it infrastructure because on a weekday of nice weather, system-wide, you'll have 20,000 trips over the course of the day. There are literally thousands of people who live in the D.C. metro, metro area that will use Capital Bike Share to get from home to work in the morning and get from work to home in the evening. Except not really to home as close to home. Um, so I know this is a talk about JavaScript and stuff, but I want to take a really indulgent minute to talk about my actual favorite topic in the whole world, Washington, D.C. So uh, let's put 60 seconds on the clock. And uh, ready? All right. The Constitution gives Congress the right to designate 10 square miles of some existing state as a new capital. And in 1790, they decided on some land on the Potomac River between Maryland and Virginia. And they hired this French guy named Pierre Lenfant to come up with the actual plan of the city. And he started with a pretty sensible grid, but then uh, ended up having a terrible idea and drawing these diagonal avenues going everywhere. <laughs> and then he was acting like a jerk, and Thomas Jefferson fired him in place of Benjamin Banneker, who actually finished the road plan with a road that ran along the top called Boundary Road, which was supposed to be the end of the city because really, how many people were ever going to live here had been here during the summer? But also because there's this giant hill that ran north of the road that actually your horse was going to be way too lazy to ever climb. So anyway, everyone kind of ignored it for 20 years, and then the city and burned half the city, and now it's kind of, we actually kind of stuck to the plan. That's what exists today. Except that we never built those canals in the National Mall, and Delaware Avenue got turned into train tracks, and Virginia took its part and kept it, and then we built, went way beyond down the road and filled out the whole city. But you lose this one section that is the worst intersection in the city. It somehow got like ignored and turned into Wendy's, but it worked together because Garrett Dan made Hunt Circle one hot city at a time. <laughs> and the federal government, you probably want to have your office right next to their office, right? 
Well, DC has this really fun law called the Height of Buildings Act. Uh, Congress passed it on us back in 1910, and while there's a lot of uh, like wild myths that go around about buildings being no taller than the Capitol Dome or something, what actually ends up happening is that it restricts our residential and commercial buildings to be no taller than the width of the street that they're on, functionally caps at about you know, 12, 13 to 15 stories for our skyscrapers. Supply and demand and DC residents' inability to have any input into the laws that govern us um, dictates that if there's a limited amount of proxy space available to work downtown and if there's a limited amount of vertical space too, eventually there won't be much space to live downtown and that's kind of what happened. I call it the law of Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, essentially, the neighborhoods north of this line are where people live and play and Neighborhoods south of this line are where the tourists are and where people's offices are and the four you know, branches of the federal government, the White House, Congress, the Supreme Court, and the Latin musical Candy Center. So there's also the elevation problem. Look at this. This is the 15th Street Northwest Cycle Track. It was the first north-south protected cycle lane in the city. It was built back in 2010 to coincide with Capital Bike Share. And it runs from the White House all the way up to the neighborhood of Columbia Heights, which is called that for a reason. There is this one stretch directly north of Florida Avenue, which is, by the way, what we renamed Boundary Road to be. Um, my friend Eli's place used to be on this hill, right next to that white pickup truck. Trust me, walking up that hill sucks. It's a 9% gradient. Tour de France riders struggle with that. Uh, and they're not riding up on an 18-kilogram tank bike. So when it's the end of a long day of work, and you're lazy, and you know there's that one bike share station right at the bottom of the hill, you just you kind of slide in there, but then the bikes, just, the bikes don't rebound, right? So these problems aren't unique to DC, of course. And so the company that runs our bike share system and a dozen others around the country employ these people to drive around all day in balancing vans, just moving bikes from place to place. And sometimes this isn't enough, so this past year they introduced a program called Bike Angels, which tells basically that but for you. And now we can kind of talk about my terrible idea. Uh, I have to be honest here, I don't really have a great origin story for this. I remember specifically going to a bar and talking to my friend and telling her, hey, I have this idea. I want to set the record for most bike people's points in a single day. And she looked at me, uh, drinking my fourth beer and smoking a clove, and kind of tilted her head and visibly ran through an entire list of questions in her head before finally sent me on, how? And I remember confidently responding with technology. So every 15 minutes, the Bike Angels Code looks at the number of available bikes and docks at every station and compares it to what it expects demand will be at those stations, and then assign some of those stations to be one, two, or three points for taking a bike out or putting a bike back in correspondingly. Uh, if you take a bike from a black station somewhere else, you'll get points. If you take a bike from somewhere else to a white station, you'll get points. If you take a bike from a black station to a white station, you'll get both. The system kind of has some edge cases predicated around can't take a bike from a black station to another black station. The whole goal is to actually encourage people to rebalance things and not just move them around. But you've gamified your thing. What's the best way to get people to actually use it? Well, here's the NerdCraft web page on Capital Lecture's site that has a live updating monthly leaderboard of all the people with opt into the program that have points. And at the bottom of that page is this curious little section called record folders. And the record was 124 points for a single day. I could beat that, right? Okay, so the maximum number of points you can get on any individual ride is six. That's three out and three in. Uh, I would need to do 21 of those in a day at least if I was going to break this record. If there's any way to predict how the algorithm is going to pop up points when and where, I'm going to want to know what that is. Job one in forensics is collect data. Luckily, Capital Bike Share publishes historical CSVs going all the way back to 2010 of every single trip that's been taken, when and where. And they also have this endpoint that has a list of all of the stations, the current number of points and bikes and empty docks 
GPS coordinates. It's not exactly an API, but I've been using it for about five years to teach new code school students how to do Ajax. So nice little benign neglect. Um, I wrote some code to scrape all this down every 15 minutes, threw it into the Cron tab of a $5 droplet, and played one for a few weeks. In the meantime, I used to make sure to get around the town as much as I could, partially to memorize all the one minute length lanes, but also to play with expectations. Say I take the last bike at a station, would it take a while before that station was assigned points by the algorithm? Could I force bonuses to appear? If so, this makes it a lot easier. Well, not really. What I found out pretty quickly is that while the assignment of points to a station is partially a function of the number of bikes and docks there, there's something more sophisticated, more machine learning going on in the code that makes deducing its priors a practical possibility. Um, it sure seems like the algorithm takes into account the following. Uh, this is from the rebalancing band. The day of the week. The weather. The historical demand at this time of day. The historical demand at this time of year. It, AKA is it the spring or fall. And like a fluid dynamics model of every station within 500 meters. So deduction's gonna be impossible here, but what about induction? If I can come up with a uh, lot, like I can make some logical assumptions and guesses about how this algorithm works, I can try to do them, and, to, and until they're like, disproven, I can use them to try and maximize points for minimal effort. At this point, it just becomes a video game, and I'm playing it against the computer. In a way, it's kind of like endurance kinesthetic speed running. And my controller is on my keychain. So after I had that few weeks straight data, I built this data visualization tool to see where points have been assigned over time. By the way, if you want to know a really terrible idea that you shouldn't do, uh, it's building your own map component in React. Like, <laughs> cartography is a, a serious problem well beyond my level of uh, expertise. But you can drag this and kind of see an update, and the red stations are where points are available, and you know the bigger and redder they are, the more. The blue ones are where points are available for you know taking bikes out. And at Morning Rush, you can see that the downtown area is you know, worth a lot of points for taking bikes out as people arrive there, and more and more people are going to arrive to full, full stations that you can't put a bike in. Uh, where people live up in Columbia Heights is going to be very, like, you know, full because of that. And we fast forward over and all the way to Evening Rush, you'll see that it sort of flips the script a little bit. Downtown is now worth more points because there are more people who want to use Capital Bike Share than there are bikes downtown. And this big blue circle right here at 15th and W Northwest is right next to Florida Avenue. It was the station we looked at earlier. And there's a lot of people who will park their bike there and not want to ride up that hill and who can blame them. Um, here's one thing I noticed pretty fast. At 15, 30, and 45 past the hour, the points would change for a station if it was no longer full or no longer empty. But at, uh, you know, at the top of the hour, everything changed. My guess is that historical expectations of demand are bucketed into the hours of the day and dramatically influence the calculations for the subsequent four seconds. Some basic math told me that if I focused on the goal of 12 points an hour or three per segment, I would be able to get this done within 10 hours. That's like 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's a reasonable day of effort. And especially if I could leverage the higher point values on upper during the morning rush. Uh, I did some test runs, and let me know the Lumini reagent was actually going to be walking between stations to sustainably hit three points every 15 minutes. I was going to need to look for nearby station pairs with point asymmetries, but over the course of a few hours of lunch breaks, I felt confident I could actually find them and pull this off. So on Monday, July 15th, I just decided to go for it. So for record attempt number one, spoiler alert, uh, I started after breakfast in a pretty residential part of town. I opened up the app and saw that I was surrounded by two to three point white stations. Great, awesome. All I needed to do was to find the bike and take it there, and there was a reason why they were all worth points. The nearest bike was a kilometer's walk away. So once I finally got a bike from the station outside Metro Center, which, by the way, will come back there a lot, uh, I took the bike uphill from where I started. First ride was worth five points. Uh, from there, I realized that there was another station that was nearby, and you get a three-point ride out of that, 
row that on uh, the sidewalk contra flow the traffic for longer than I'm proud to admit. But eventually got onto the 15th Street cycle path and started getting into a groove of just taking us taking bikes from downtown to slightly further uptown where people still wanted to ride. At 1010, I found a station pair that was about 450 meters apart from each other that was worth four points. But at 1014, when the thing changed over, I realized that there was now a 200 meter difference uh, station pair with four points. And in the next 15 minute segment, I hit that five times. I ran between stations. There were definitely people looking at their phones being like, who are you? Uh, then I got an ice coffee because it was a little bit hotter out than I thought it was going to be. But I sent a text to a bunch of my friends saying, hey, I'm on through incredible pace. I'm going to be done by happy hour. Uh, then I got a couple more rides that were worth two points each before 11 a.m., at which point the expectations started to change and the points dried up dramatically. Uh, the Metro Center station was worth a lot of points because it was full, but there weren't really many places to put the bikes there, so I just started shifting them literally wherever I could around downtown. <laughs> Um, and then the station started to be worth fewer points, so I went on a little bit of an experimental ride down towards the wharf. It's a new development in DC. It's pretty far away from everything else. But there's two stations down there, and the dad this tool told me that there would probably be some nice point asymmetries around 12 o'clock. So I rode all the way across downtown, parked my bike, got out, looked at the app, and said a main cuss word because I was now surrounded by no points within a whole kilometer. Uh, so that kind of has a problem, and I parked my bike in a now full station and was experiencing some consequences like dehydration, and Kylie should have put on sunblock. Uh, I made my way to the station that was near the left place and parked it, and when I got halfway across the sidewalk to where this lunch place was, I realized the consequences of what I'd done, which were that the station was probably now going to have points for it in the next two, uh, next 10 minutes. So instead of getting Gatorade or a sandwich or making smart decisions, I decided to just kind of keep going. So every like, so when, at 12.30, that station was worth two points for taking a bike out, and again, I just took them to wherever I could possibly go, uh, and instead of making smart decisions, I got a worth of 60 points, and by the end of this hour, I actually took a bike from one neighborhood to another, uh, crossing the 63-point halfway mark, and then I really started experiencing consequences. So, that Monday was supposed to have really bad nice weather, and it ended up being 94 degrees Fahrenheit. If anyone's been to DC in the summer, uh, you'll know that it, the heat index hitting 102 is not uncommon. When the heat index crosses 90, DC school children aren't allowed to play outside during recess. I might have been better off trying to hang out in the shade, but all those solar powered bike share stations are not going to help out. Uh, but I slowed it on a little bit. I got on the metro, I took it to Union Station, I got a three point bike at that station there, and took it somewhere else. Looked at the map and saw that there was a possible two-point ride that would get me from nearby to the station that was next to my house. And if you're going to be honest, I knew that I was probably done at that particular moment. Parked the bike, looked at my phone. I had 8% battery left, and I was shattered physically in a very real way. And I went home, and I went to sleep. <laughs> and that was record attempt number one. <laughs> Uh, so, I will admit that my preparation for record attempt number one was uh, maybe a little suboptimal. Uh, there was definitely room for improvement, but I couldn't try again for a while as the entire East Coast immediately started experiencing the worst heat wave of the summer. Uh, for the next eight days, the high temperature stayed north of 95 in DC with the heat index in the 110s. To give you an idea, right now outside in San Diego, where the winter is pretty consistent gorgeous, the heat index is 72. So that's in direct sunlight, which I was all day. So, like, no BS. Even standing in a 110 heat index for like five minutes is just like not just uncomfortable pictures. But let's pretend that I prepared correctly. Let's assume that next time out I made smarter routing decisions, controlled for the weather, and presuppose I focused on keeping a sustainable pace the entire time instead of burning out early. If the question I asked, like, 
125 slides ago, was can I do this? Can I score more than 120 points in a single day? I think the answer is yeah. I think I actually can. It's definitely possible at least. You know, the algorithm has weak points and I successfully exploited some of them to get as close as I did. So all my free time the next week or so is focused on building tools to make those assumptions true. First off, let's take a look at the paths that I can take. It's trying to know the distance between stations as the crow flies, but it turns out lots of people aren't cool if you ride into their building's lobby. And what's more, there are lots of roads, those diagonals get out of use, that are kind of unsafe to bike on. Uh, if I want to stick to the bike lanes as much as possible, then the quantity of asphalt that I'm never actually going to see is going to shrink dramatically. Uh, from that, I kind of realized that I could turn all of the stations and the one-way bike lanes into a directed graph. And it's pretty easy to calculate the measurements between those two points if you just use the right circle formula. But the other part that sucks a lot, so much, is going uphill. And luckily, there's the Open Elevation API. So I ran all those no uh locations against it, and since this is a directed graph, I could figure out a rough approximation of the elevation gain going each way. And by mathing together the distance of hills on each vector, I was able to reason out a single effort value between each pair of stations in each direction. And that makes this just a traveling salesman problem. Um, <laughs> Next up is routing. Uh, so after a few hours of riding and race walking, my decision making really started, started to backslide. If I'm chilling on my couch with a glass of ice water and my laptop with the data visualization up and you pick a random station, I can look at the current map and find you some smart decisions to make within a few seconds because I've spent way too much time looking at that map. But if I'm outside, I'm less capable, I have less tools, and I'm also getting consistently tired. But what if I can outsource my own decision making here? So over the next couple of days, I hacked together a real quick and dirty, like why would anyone use try capture check for air conditions, uh, a React app that let me input a station and it considered that combined distance elevation metric, um, all the straight data and the current state of affairs, and figured out a nearby station pair predicated on my own logic that would actually make this, you know, that would be the next smart decision to make. But don't worry, this gets more terrible because I had concerns about conserving my cell, my cell battery and iOS Chrome chews through that really fast. So instead of using a web app, why not use some phantom JS magic and just look at the capital life share member portal constantly. If at the center bottom you've got that last trip thing and it changes every time that I finish the trip near instantaneously. Why not just write some code to look for when that updates, assume that I'm at the, at the end station and that I want another ride, and then just make one call to the decision making API and the second call to Twilio, and then just send me a text message huh. with stats and directions and occasional random encouragements. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now I was ready to give this another shot. Uh, Wednesday the 24th was going to be the day with possibly the nicest weather in uh, DC all summer. 83 degrees. Yes, I know San Diego. Yes, I know. Uh, partly cloudy and looking good. Record attempt number two was going to take place on possibly the highest system-wide ridership in months. I'm stretch out, let's do this. So the days around that from a three-point ride within my own neighborhood, within 10 seconds of docking, I had a text message from API me. It said to go down the street, get another bike, then do that route, got another text message, I did another route, I got another text message. I'm fast forwarding through this all because there is absolutely no drama in the lines. Everything worked perfectly, which is never what you expect from a hack project. The high system wide demand, and there are very few dramatic point asymmetries, like I'm not going to get a 20.7 this time, but I was able to stay within the same 10 block radius of Metro Center all morning, and I was riding at a sustainable pace, I was hydrating, I was applying sunblock, I was cleaning. <laughs> uh, I took a lunch break and I ran to my friend Alexis. Uh, Alexis and I worked together a couple of jobs ago, and she asked me, What are you up to? And I think that she meant what is your current employer? And <laughs> what I interpreted that as was a little bit more in the moment. Um, see, 
terrible ideas like this one are inscrutable. If something made enough sense to be able to explain the how and why to someone and the time it takes to assemble a sandwich, um, it's probably not that terrible an idea, and you're also not the only person to have had it. Now, those terrible ideas are tragically personal. They are arts of the kind that only you'll ever know how to make, and they happen to people, not for people. Until they get pursued, they just kind of live as this like ethereal, unexplainable dream. Like, who wants to listen to some guy talk about my share points for a half hour? <laughs> <laughs> so after lunch I went to Union Station, and uh, since that's the one day blue dot always came up in the database in the afternoon. And for the next two hours, I just moved bikes over and over and over again to the same station that was right outside of the supermarket. The station was next to a window ledge where the employees would take their smoke breaks and watch me bike over and walk away with the tent every ten minutes like a Russian doll time loop. <laughs> really wonder what they thought I was doing. Uh, so eventually at 2.30, I emptied one of the smaller stations with the group, help of a group of very, very confused tourists. And that's why I sent a text to my wife. Hey, Kate, I'm on an incredible pace, and I'm pretty sure if the next segment change, that station I just emptied is going to be worth points for putting bikes back in. I'm going to be done by happy hour. <laughs> yeah, you know that's not going to uh, at 2.45, the points updated. That small station, that second G that I completely emptied, it was now worth points, for sure, for taking bikes out of it. Bikes that did not presently exist. I'm not entirely sure what I had done to the Bike Angels algorithm in that moment. <laughs> what untested and unknown code I had just uncovered. But honestly, I think I instantiated a corner case so strange, alien, and novel that I think it's just instinctually starting defending itself. <laughs> so, okay, capital is not being more fruitful with points, but I was getting close to finishing. I just needed to change the approach. The API wasn't going to be helpful here, so I realized that I could get across town and take a five point ride, but I need to get there fast. So I took the metro across town, and in order to get there before 314, I ran up the escalator, and I I think that's when I heard Toy behind my ankle. I'm not sure, but from this moment on, walking sucked. Which was not great because the API kept sending me to places over and over and over again that were farther and farther away as the points disappeared off the map. And I hit triple digits, but now I'm really kind of feeling it. And it's, it's hot and I'm tired and exhausted. And here was the real problem. At 417, I took a bike out and I just took it like three blocks away, and the API crunch. See, it turns out, quick and dirty hacks, you should still throw a try catch in there and check for empty arrays. And now I'm all alone, and it's, you know, 15 minutes past, nothing. At 4.45, there's a three, there's a, uh, a station pair that's three blocks away, one point each, I did that four times, five o'clock hits, no more points around for a kilometer in every direction. And I just, walked down there, right on the sidewalk, and <sighs> made sent some text messages, and gave some thought, and called for a lift to go home. <laughs> you know that feeling when you're utterly exhausted, and you just desperately need no part of your body to possibly be able to touch any other part of your body? <laughs> That's me, on my bed, with my internal monologue giving me a wonderful lecture, because I don't have any other entertainment. Because I can't move my body. And it went like this. Kyle, what are you what what are you doing? What are you trying to accomplish here? Do you do you think anyone's going to understand what you're doing? Do you understand what you're doing? You quit everything you ever do about 80% of the way through. I mean, look at that map that you just showed before. Why? Why do you think this would be any different? And you smell awful. <laughs> and at that point, my senses and my internal monologue breathe. And so I walked very gingerly over into the shower and turned it on and just stood there for five, ten minutes. Mind blank, blistered, exhausted, sore. And I thought about a text message I got from my wife right after I told her I was going to quit. And I, 
I don't know, I started to feel a little better because my ankle did. And I thought, I, I, I can make it to happy hour, I think. I don't, I, I don't want to walk there. I can't walk there. I sure don't drive. I suck at that. But I can bike over. <laughs> <laughs> So y'all seem smart, so you probably already know how this ends. Um, the fun part of terrible ideas is that while they cannot be explained to any other person ever, if you pursue them to their logical conclusion, they, they leave a beautiful course. I have code that I wrote for this that, with really good ideas that generated. I have a rekindled love for JavaScript in the city that I live in. I have a very interesting life lesson that I honestly came by that taught me some things about persistence and determination. I have a story to tell about the time I set a world record for bike share points by biking 41 miles and walking a half marathon. And that story includes the time I took the very last bike out from that station right below Bitterney Hill Park. And on my beautiful day, the skies opened. And I rode down the 15th Street cycle track through the most celebratory thunderstorm I will ever experience. <laughs> Not an obstacle thrown in my way by an algorithm, but a real, alive, visceral experience. I'm never going to forget it. And I remember walking in to the very crowded bar afterwards, soaked to the skin, and Kate handed me that promised margarita. Huh. And she introduced me to her brand new colleague. And he asked me, so what did you do today? 